Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joshua Plick, and I have an ambitious goal with this presentation. Test-driven development promises to give you a lot more structure to your development process. It promises to give you more reliable software, but I'm going to make an additional claim where it will allow you to do so faster. It will liberate you from fear, giving you rock solid confidence, and it will enable you to be the hero of your team. So that is a lot that I'm making the claim of, and I will be looking to back that up in this speech today. Our field, the software development field, is riddled with people who feel like imposters. And there's a reason for this. The reason why is because other fields, lawyers, doctors, dentists, other engineers, whether they be mechanical or civil engineers, they all have something that defines who they are as a doctor or a lawyer or, a, or an engineer. The lawyers, they have a bar exam, something that if they do not pass, they are not a lawyer. A doctor has to be board certified. They are recognized as someone who can perform health care on other human beings. Engineers, especially. So I'm a mechanical engineer. I went to school. Uh, I went to at the University of Florida, I have a mechanical engineering degree. And there's a fundamentals exam that you have to pass. And then you have to have four years of training and then you have to pass a professional engineer's exam. But us, of course, I'm not a mechanical engineer anymore. Us, the software engineers, there is no standard. There's no definition. There's no point in time when you can call yourself, what is the difference between a tinkerer, a hacker, a coder, and an engineer? Guess what? There's no definition. And so today we're going to be defining that. And so what I would like to pose to you first is a few set of questions. So I want to give a shout out to Evan Dorn, who gave a speech 10 years ago called Test Driven Development, Write Better Code in Less Time to LA Ruby. And that's where this slide comes from. So let's look at this slide real quick. Washing hands and organizing surgical tools wastes a lot of time. I could help more patients if I just dove in. That probably sounds a bit insane, right? Let's move on to another field. Let's, let's talk about engineers and architects. Quote, we know how skyscrapers work. Just give us some bricks and we'll get started. As you can tell, these are hyperbolic, but this is ultimately how software engineers approach their craft because we don't have a standard, we have no set of processes. And the difference between the definition of a professional is that the reason why lawyers and engineers and doctors don't go through imposter syndrome and they don't have fear not knowing who they are as what being a doctor or a lawyer is because they design, they plan, and they prepare what they're gonna do first. They do it in advance, and then they do the work. Can you imagine a surgeon who's gonna replace your knee, uh, actually opening up your knee without having a plan first? But why is it that we approach software, something that is an exact science? Software either works or it doesn't. And for some reason, when we approach our craft, we kind of just jump in. The end result and the reason why professionals are professionals is because they get better results and they have it faster. There's a difference between hiring an electrician, a certified electrician, and a handyman. A handyman is going to just get it done, and it might be crazy, but an electrician, you know that it was done right. How do you ensure those results? The difference is process. Once again, shout out to Evan Dorn. I stole your slides. It's because when I saw your speech 10 years ago, you're the one who convinced me to do test driven development and I have not looked back. Process is the difference between surgery and cutting people open. Process is the difference between software engineering and programming. So the difference between all our professional fields, they have standards, they have processes, and then they have to uphold the standards. They can be removed from their professional status. A doctor, has to spend years of residency and they can be removed from being a doctor. A lawyer can be disbarred. An engineer can be prevented from practicing his or her craft. So the professional has standards, processes. And then in addition to that, there's an upholding of the standards. So what does this mean for us? What is the standard for us software engineers when we don't even have a standard? We don't even have a process. And guess what? 
you and I both know imposters in our field. They may be, hopefully not, but they may be even on your own team. These are people who have charisma. They are happy-go-lucky with the boss. They get very little done. They're playing World of Warcraft on the job. We all know these people. They are in our field. They are among us. They are the imposters. We don't want to be them. And so what I'm going to help define us for us today is the standard for software engineering. But before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm qualified to define that standard. So I'm Joshua Plick. I have an elixir of software consultancy named Or Equals. I also have a YouTube channel where I talk about Live View, Live View and I do programming tutorials for Phoenix Live View and Elixir. And in addition to that, I hold a mechanical engineering degree from the University of Florida in the United States. So the standard, let me give you five years of engineering education in five minutes. So there's this link that I have on this slide. This is a, a senior level class that I took almost eight or nine years ago. This is, uh, the class was called Finite Element Analysis where you could effectively define the equation. Actually, I don't even remember what it is at this point. But what I do know is that there's a link on this slide to this professor in particular. They wanted us, he wanted us to actually show our work online. And so what I want to show you here is all for every single one, this was a team assignment, right? Contributing team members. Here's me at the bottom, Joshua Plick. This was seven or eight years ago at the University of Florida. And I want you to see something at the top of this slide. So you see all these fancy graphs and all this stuff, but notice how for every single problem, there's a find, there's a given, and then there's a solution step. So what does that mean? In engineering school, we had to always start off by defining the problem. The next step after that was listing our assumptions. And then and, then, and only then were we able to actually design our solution. Therefore, let me go back to the slides because now I'm flipped over here. I'm a little bit lost. Okay. The, the process to be a mechanical engineer, something that I've taken with me into this craft is find given solution. You define the problem, you list your assumptions, and then you solve the problem. And notably, get check this out. I'm going to say this twice. We actually lost points in engineering school if we had the problem solved, but we didn't actually define what the problem was. The reason why is because in engineering school, we were held to a standard that whenever you solve a problem, you must do these three steps. You must define what it is you're solving. You must say what it is that is constraining your problem. And then and only then can you design your solution. And in the software engineering field, that last step, the solving of the problem, most of us start off at step three. We don't even know what we're solving. We're jumping in, we're writing code, and we end up with code that isn't even being used, you know, you get the compiler warnings, oh, unused function. And the reason why is because you're you're flailing around and you don't even know what problem that you're actually solving. And so in the engineering craft, the actual definition of a solution. So specifically in engineering school, I also was, I always also learned that the definition of a solution is broad. We had multiple design and engineering classes. They never gave us any guidance to that. The, the definition of a solution was that does it solve the business problem? Did nothing else break? And is it fast? And ultimately, these three steps define how to solve a problem. This is the difference between a tinkerer and an engineer. This is what I learned in engineering school, and I'm bringing it to this craft. So I can tell that you guys are getting bored, so we're going to speed up, right? Let's actually talk about test-driven development. Uh, the test-driven development process actually defines the engineering standard, which is Step one, you start off with a failing test, which the failing test actually defines your problem. You're defining a problem, you have a failing test because the problem hasn't been solved. And then in your test, you actually set up, like you, you set up your problem and then you assert, you, you execute your, your new code and then your test passes, your solution. And because you have a passing test, you've actually solved, you've defined the standard and you've up upheld the standard, which is, I've confirmed that I've solved the business problem. I've confirmed that nothing else broke because all my other tests passed. And I've confirmed that my solution is fast. So test-driven development, it solves a business problem. This is the standard. It, the engineering standard, in all engineering disciplines, you always start off with those three steps. What is my problem? What are my assumptions? And what is my solution? And test-driven development gives you a harness with which to define your, your problem and gives you 
just essentially a playground to solve your solution. The reason why you end up with all that extra code when you're solving this problem is because we live in a world of infinite complexity. Like for example, on, on my board behind me, I've got this book, Concurrent Data Processing in Elixir. So within every second that passes by in real life, there's an infinite amount of complexity. We could talk about the Gutenberg printing press. We could talk about Zvilin Gospodinov, who wrote this book in Concurrent Data Processing in Elixir. How did he, how was he able to write this book? By defining your problem, you limit the scope. You actually are able to deploy the your huge intelligence towards this one problem in front of you. And this is a big reason why test-driven development allows you to work actually faster. But someone in the crowd right now is saying like, bro, bro, like who has time to write tests? Like, you know, my engineering manager, my engineering manager, I've had engineering managers tell me when I got very dogmatic about tests, hey, Josh, I want you to go fix this problem, but I don't want you to write tests and damn sure don't refactor my code. So as you can probably guess, I probably I left that organization uh, shortly after I was being told not to write tests and refactor my solutions. So with that being said, let's talk about engineer's day. So you're telling me when I have to write tests, I have to write two to three times more code to solve the same problem? That makes no sense. And then you're also telling me I'm going to be going faster. So a very productive day for me, Joshua Plick, coding is about 500 to 900 lines of code. And that's whip tests. And so how long would this take for me to write if you knew what you're going to write in advance? So 500 to 900 lines of code, this is something you could write in 20 or 30 minutes. So the argument that writing tests slows me down is not a good one because the actual writing of code is not what we do all day. What we do all day is that we research solutions. We're putting stuff in chat GPT. We're uh, conferring with colleagues on Twitter. We're reading other people's code. We have to debug our solution. We're testing things by hand because we don't have tests that are actually allowing us to have a tight feedback loop. That's a key phrase that I'm gonna say in this presentation. Because we don't have tests, we don't have a tight feedback loop for solving our problem. So say we're uploading a CSV, we have to go back into the browser, click on it, re-upload it. We're thinking and all that to say, testing is not the reason why test-driven development will slow you down. Test-driven development will make you faster because it's going to limit the scope of your problems and it's going to help you by giving you just a scaffolding with which to solve your problem. So test after, test after development is very obvious what the benefits are because you have living documentation of your code, it catches your future errors, and most importantly, something that no, very few people talk about and enables refactors in your organization. The reason why testing and test-driven development is so powerful is because like, Aren't you tired of, aren't you tired of being scared? Like very often, because I'm a developer consultant, I go into code bases and I see code paths that are very impossible to go down. There's nil checks, you know, you're counting for cases that don't exist. And the reason why is because very often developers are scared because they don't know whether their code works and whether their code will continue to work and whether it didn't break something else. Test after, having tests on your code enables confidence. But there's an, a, an additional set of benefits by writing your test first. Test first development is hard because that's not the way our, our mind is typically constructed. Engineering tools, five years of beating down those three steps, defining the problem, defining your assumptions, and getting your, to your solution. Because as humans, we naturally were built to, to make tools and to solve problems. And so you want to go with step number three. But the difference between a professional and a, and a hacker is having a process before you define, you, you design your solution because anybody can code, but what is the difference between an engineer and a hacker? That the engineer has a process with which they, de they design their code. So test-driven development, let me convince you to do it because with test-driven development, you get your design up front and you, you have lightning fast feedback loops. And this, is the core reason why you get faster with test driven development because you have tight feedback loops. Instead of having to, it's very rare that I have to look into a web browser or use Postman. Like I'm someone who does full stack development. I do Phoenix Live View development. And it's isn't that strange that someone who's working with HTML all day very rarely looks at a browser? This is what test driven development enables you to do. And every single failure, you, you get instant results. You get, instead of do, taking 
45 seconds or 30 seconds to click around in your browser, you get one second and you get that instant feedback loop and you're, you solve your problem, you know it's solved and you're able to go and define your next problem. And this is why test room development is almost like, it's like entering a flow state. It's like, it's like, it's like music within the development process. So TDD is this, the Shangri-La of speed is because you have these lightning fast feedback loops and it limits the universe of your problems. So test room development. And so we're gonna jump into some examples. So like, so I know that I'm, I'm very heady right now. So we're gonna actually jump in and actually define some, some real problems and work against them. So test room development defines the engineering standard. It defines your problem. And because you have to set up to execute your test, it, it um, you end up having a process with which to do the test room and development, and it forever upholds your standard because your tests, as they run, they automatically make sure that no one can break your code and that when you're refactoring in the future, that everything's going to be fine. So what is a test? So this is something that I was working on recently for one of our clients, Local Fair Jacks. They deliver local groceries from uh, the area. So we need to define what a test is. And so a test is, it defines a problem. So within the scope of, of what we were doing for Local Fair Jacks, we were building them an API for their drivers. They were building them a whole routing uh, feature set where uh, they could have drivers on the road and then they could click a button in the app and it would up, update an external API. So the problem was that, wait, what if we needed to inactivate drivers? So the problem is that inactive drivers, they won't be able to access the API. The app will essentially lock, lock them out. So the setup here, Writing a test first is that you create a driver, you create an API token for that driver, and then you inactivate the driver. And then the next step, so there's always three steps to creating a test. There's setup, act, and assert. So we just did the setup. Act is actually trying to make the API call from the inactive driver. And the assert is that the inactive driver is forbidden from accessing the API. So when I, this is a, literally something that I worked on yesterday. And so here's the test. It returns a 403 if the driver's inactive. That first line of code, we create a driver, and create a token for them. We update that driver for their so that this person is not active anymore. And then finally, we actually execute the API call, and then we assert that the response is a 403 or for, forbidden. So I wrote this test. It failed because this feature didn't actually exist. And so this now limits the scope of my problems. I know exactly what I need to do to solve this problem. So therefore, I went in and I created a plug for this. So I added it to my router, ensure the driver is active. If the person's active, then we just keep the con going. Otherwise, we put the status of forbidden, we return an error forbidden, JSON error, and then we halt the con so that no other plugs run. So I was able to do this, and this is something I was able to solve in like 10 minutes. And it, I didn't have to use Postman. I didn't have to use curl commands. I didn't have to test anything by hand because I had the test first. I was able to define the problem. An inactive driver cannot hit the API, and I have 100% rock solid confidence that this problem is solved. And guess what? With this problem in particular, I, I put con and I put the status and I was returning, a, I used the send response uh, function on plug.con instead of JSON. So in, in the slide, you see that I'm using JSON and I was running into errors. I ran into four errors before I was able to, to get this code solved. But because I was using test-driven development, not only did I have a harness where I had instant results, instant feedback with which to solve this problem, but when I did finish the problem, it was clear that I was done. I had a passing test. I had documentation. I had living documentation of the test, documenting what the, the feature does so that someone can understand it in the future. And I was able to move on with my life and move on to the next problem. And this is a big problem that we have is without having a harness without our, around our thoughts with test room development. That's why I went through that example with the book. You, you've got all this universe of problems that you can solve. The world is riddled with problems. But with test room development, it isolates your, your intelligence to the problem at hand. And you can just solve something like this and you just move on. And you and it's just, it's fun. It's like, like it, and it, it leads to so much confidence. Like when our clients come to me and they report production outages, like there's a slide at the end of this presentation. I'm gonna show you guys like a, conver a Slack conversation I had with a, a, an additional contractor on my team. Like the level of confidence it has, like when people come to you with problems, like the clients know that it's probably their fault. The reason why is because when they come to me, I'm going to be looking at them like this. Like I'm going to be like this sitting back in my chair. Why? Because I have confidence. And because I have confidence, I'm we're able to refactor code bases. And this anyway, 
let me let me move on. So like I said, when you have test driven development, I rarely look at a web browser or use Postman and you know that your problem is solved. You trust that your code solves the problem. It documents your solution for developers that come, come after you and it enables your team to refactor in the future. Like the, the number of benefits are substantial. I've already said this. So effectively test driven development gives you better code, more reliably and less time. And so I know I've, I've spent a long part of this presentation to describe the the problem at hand. And the reason why is because very often, like the difference between doing test room and development and doing testing is in the belief that it's going to help you, it's going to be worth it, and you're not going to be wasting your time. And so with this presentation, like really my goal is to show you that, like I'm trying to liberate you from the, the fear of refactoring code, the, the fear that your code may break something else. And so like you may not go and re go down that big refactor because you don't have any test coverage against you. But as you add tests and you're doing test room development, like you just like the hero of your team. Like you just know your stuff works. Like it's amazing. But I do have one big caveat. So if you go and you leave this conference and you immediately start doing test room development, you will be slower at first. The reason why is because typically, remember, you're in the engineering process, you're very often, you might be going to step three first. You're designing your solution. You're all over the place. Okay, yeah, okay, I'll delete this code when I'm like, oh, I don't need this code anymore. You're going to be slower at first because writing tests first, designing up front is hard. But that is the difference between the programmer, the hacker, and the professional. So one of the, another big benefit of test driven development is the scaffolding you get for edge cases so that when errors do happen, the thing with code is that it's always underneath change. It's a living entity because as life goes on, problems, problems occur. And let me just describe this problem at hand. So within that local fair Jax code base, we did an, uh, a CSV import of routes from another piece of software, essentially. So this test is we've got this, these members in the database, we have orders in the database, and we're importing uh, this CSV of orders. And what it's doing is it's, it's updating the driver name. If you look at the very last line of this test, it says it asserts that the order that's in the database now is assigned to the driver name Josh when it wasn't before. So that's what this test is, is doing. It's essentially like it, it's getting routes from another piece of software. It's reading a CSV. It's importing it into the system. And this is the end result. So this is a test uh, driven problem. And so here's the solution where we import, we're doing a file.stream, we're, we're mapping over all of the elements in the CSV, and we're effectively just updating orders in the database so that we know who the driver is that this order needs to go to. So we know like what truck to put the order on. Now, notably, I wanna bring your attention to those last two lines. See that pad date, pad year right here? Now, this one is really interesting because in the CSV, sometimes, like look at this, this last part right here. In that CSV, see the date there where it says 11-3-2021? So in, for the CSV, sometimes it has a full year, the year 2021, and sometimes it just has 21. And so this was one of the bugs that we encountered. And so what I was able to do was I was able to very confidently, without even never testing this in production, I was able to write a failing test for a different date style. So instead of having 11-3-21, it might be 4-20-2022. And so I wrote that test. I executed it. Hey, does it parse this row? The test fails. And so that's what led me to be able to add these two lines so, so that it supports both when you have a two digit year and a four digit year. And I was able to deploy this with confidence. I was able to get harness around this problem. And so I was able to deploy the, the full power of my intelligence at this problem. And this is the value of test room and development. And ultimately, I know we're, 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 I'm close to wrapping up. I wanna answer questions. So this is Vladimir. Vladimir, all, but he goes by Vladdy, uh, which is uh, a fun short version of Vladimir. And I just kind of want to read you this conversation I have with Vladdy. He came on as a contractor into the project about um, November of last year. And this is a conversation we had in December of the same year, 30 days after he came on. So I kind of want to show you like the uh, what he was working on. 
So he was working on a very proprietary algorithm where it calculates the next delivery day for when someone's going to get an order. This is kind of like the documentation. It, this is not necessarily something to, to be read. I just want to show you how complex this is. Like it, it accounts for when someone's uh, canceled, if they're on hold, uh, if they have, uh, if they're in different places of the city, they're going to get delivered on different days. It's a very complex algorithm. So within 30 days of starting on this project, this is a conversation I have with Vlad Vladimir. Vladimir, nice freaking job on that bug fix. I'm very impressed that you pretty much have that powerful module well understood. Vladdy, 30, 30 days on the job responds to me and says, sorry for not keeping the PR nice and small. This guy's just writing code and just refactoring and going nuts. Thank you, Joshua Plick. That's perfectly okay. You refactor things nicely. I want a refactoring culture. Many organizations lack that. And it's because they don't test. So they have no safety. Your changes made me a bit nervous, but I know I've got like 80 unit tests on this. And then Vladdy says, next time I will do things more gradually. This is a conversation I'm having with somebody who's brand new to the project, who was, because we have 94, 95% test coverage, he was able to go in, refactor, make a maximum number of changes to one of the most core areas of the application. This is unheard of in organizations that do not have tests and do not are not exercising test-driven development. This is ultimately what I'm hoping for to encourage everybody to have in their life. With test-driven development, with not with tests, you're gonna have more reliable, you're gonna have more reliable code with more confidence. But with test driven development, you're going to be able to exercise your changes faster. You're going to be liberated from fear, and it's going to enable you to be the hero on your team. And that's it. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I think we have two more minutes for, for a very quick Q&A. So first question, what's your take on can test driven development can eliminate the testing phase completely? in a deployed environment like staging or pre-life and we can be confident enough shipping to production? That's a great question. Yeah, so in test driven development, very this is actually a production issue I ran into yesterday. Um, you need to test things by hand on staging still, even with test driven development, because very often your test environment and your development environments are going to be subtly different from your production environment. Those differences are, I've thought about this a lot, actually. Uh, there's your configuration may be different. Maybe you're sending a text message with the Twilio API and you set the, the uh, environment variable locally, but you didn't set it in production. You want to make sure to get at least one sanity check in production when your new code goes through, because in your testing and development environments, there's still some subtle differences. You have different data, you have different configuration, and uh, that, those, that's good enough. You have different data and, di and different configuration. And so still, you do want to have a staging environment before you go to production. But the level of QA that you need to do is, is far less in a test-driven de uh, development engineering culture. Cool. So how do you test JavaScript, like when the UI has JS-driven components? That's a good question. Yeah, so in the Phoenix Live View ecosystem, Phoenix Live View tests are actually run purely with just processes. It just does process communication to an Elixir process. You have a good point. It's not testing your app.js file by default. Therefore, there's a tool called Wallaby. Wallaby actually opens up Chrome. It, it will get you test coverage of your JavaScript test. So in Phoenix Live View, you're not going to get test coverage of your JavaScript by default. But if you need to cover something that's pretty heavy, use the, the Wallaby testing framework um, on top of EX unit. And if you look up Wallaby, then it'll test things in Chrome, which will actually test your JavaScript. Cool. Uh, one last question. Uh, where do you think we have the most room to improve test tooling in Elixir? Testing in Elixir is uh, really amazing. So if I were to give this talk in uh, the object-oriented ecosystem, there's so many techniques that you have to do um, in testing, but because we live in a functional programming paradigm, it's very, like the level of techniques that we need are very, very few. And the EX unit, um, the LabVIEW test testing framework, I mean, it just, it all works well. I would say that there's, I don't have any known improvements that I would want to make to the Elixir testing ecosystem. I think it's awesome.